On Physical Lines of Force, 1861, Part 1, The Theory of Molecular Vortices Applied to Magnetic Phenomena. In all phenomena involving attractions or repulsions or any forces depending on the relative position of bodies, we have to determine the magnitude and direction of the force which would act on a given body if placed in a given position. In the case of a body acted on by the gravitation of a sphere, this force is inversely as the square of the distance and in a straight line to the centre of the sphere. In the case of two attracting spheres, or of a body not spherical, the magnitude and direction of the force vary according to more complicated laws. In electric and magnetic phenomena, the magnitude and direction of the resultant force at any point is the main subject of investigation. Suppose that the direction of the force at any point is known then, if we draw a line so that in every part of its course it coincides in direction with the force at that point, this line may be called a line of force, since it indicates the direction of the force in every part of its course. By drawing a sufficient number of lines of force, we may indicate the direction of the force in every part of the space in which it acts. Thus, if we strew iron filings on paper near a magnet, each filing will be magnetised by induction, and the consecutive filings will unite by their opposite poles, so as to form fibres, and these fibres will indicate the direction of the lines of force. The beautiful illustration of the presence of magnetic force afforded by this experiment naturally tends to make us think of the lines of force as something real, and as indicating something more than the mere resultant of two forces, whose seat of action is at a distance, and which do not exist there at all until a magnet is placed in that part of the field. We are dissatisfied with the explanation founded on the hypothesis of attractive and repellent forces directed towards the magnetic poles, even though we may have satisfied ourselves that the phenomenon is in strict accordance with that hypothesis. And we cannot help thinking that in every place where we find these lines of force, some physical state or action must exist in sufficient energy to produce the actual phenomena. My object in this paper is to clear the way for speculation in this direction by investigating the mechanical results of certain states of tension and motion in a medium and comparing these with the observed phenomena of magnetism and electricity. By pointing out the mechanical consequences of such hypotheses, I hope to be of some use to those who consider the phenomena as due to the action of a medium, but are in doubt as to the relation of this hypothesis to the experimental laws already established which have generally been expressed in the language of other hypotheses. I have in a former paper endeavoured to lay before the mind of the geometer a clear conception of the relation of the lines of force to the space in which they are traced. By making use of the conception of currents in a fluid, I showed how to draw lines of force, which should indicate by their number the amount of force, so that each line may be called a unit line of force, and I have investigated the path of the lines where they pass from one medium to another. In the same paper I have found the geometrical significance of the electrotonic state, and have shown how to deduce the mathematical relations between the electrotonic state, magnetism, electric currents, and the electromotive force, using mechanical illustrations to assist the imagination, but not to account for the phenomena. I propose now to examine magnetic phenomena from a mechanical point of view, and to determine what tensions in, or motions of, a medium are capable of producing the mechanical phenomena observed. If, by the same hypothesis, we can connect the phenomena of magnetic attraction with electromagnetic phenomena and with those of induced currents, we shall have found a theory which, if not true, can only be proved to be erroneous by experiments which will greatly enlarge our knowledge of this part of physics. The mechanical conditions of a medium under magnetic influence have been variously conceived of, as currents, undulations, or states of displacement or strain, or of pressure or stress. Currents, issuing from the North Pole and entering the South Pole of a magnet, or circulating round an electric current, have the advantage of representing correctly the geometrical arrangement of the lines of force, if we could account on mechanical principles for the phenomena of attraction, or for the currents themselves, or explain their continued existence. Undulations issuing from a center would, according to the calculations of Professor Shalley, produce an effect similar to attraction in the direction of the center, but admitting this to be true, we know that two series of undulations traversing the same space do not combine into one resultant as two attractions do, but produce an effect depending on relations of phase as well as intensity, and if allowed to proceed, they diverge from each other without any mutual action. In fact the mathematical laws of attractions are not analogous in any respect to those of undulations, while they have remarkable analogies with those of currents, of the conduction of heat and electricity, and of elastic bodies.
In the Cambridge and Dublin Mathematical Journal for January 1847, Professor William Thomson has given a mechanical representation of electric, magnetic, and galvanic forces, by means of the displacements of the particles of an elastic solid in a state of strain. In this representation we must make the angular displacement at every point of the solid proportional to the magnetic force at the corresponding point of the magnetic field, the direction of the axis of rotation of the displacement corresponding to the direction of the magnetic force. The absolute displacement of any particle will then correspond in magnitude and direction to that which I have identified with the electrotonic state, and the relative displacement of any particle, considered with reference to the particle in its immediate neighborhood, will correspond in magnitude and direction to the quantity of electric current passing through the corresponding point of the magnetoelectric field. The author of this method of representation does not attempt to explain the origin of the observed forces by the effects due to these strains in the elastic solid, but makes use of the mathematical analogies of the two problems to assist the imagination in the study of both. We come now to consider the magnetic influence as existing in the form of some kind of pressure or tension, or, more generally, of stress in the medium. Stress is action and reaction between the consecutive parts of a body, and consists in general of pressures or tensions different in different directions at the same point of the medium. The necessary relations among these forces have been investigated by mathematicians, and it has been shown that the most general type of a stress consists of a combination of three principal pressures or tensions, in directions at right angles to each other. When two of the principal pressures are equal, the third becomes an axis of symmetry, either of greatest or least pressure, the pressures at right angles to this axis, being all equal. When the three principal pressures are equal, the pressure is equal in every direction, and there results a stress having no determinate axis of direction, of which we have an example in simple hydrostatic pressure. The general type of a stress is not suitable as a representation of a magnetic force, because a line of magnetic force has direction and intensity, but has no third quality indicating any difference between the sides of the line, which would be analogous to that observed in the case of polarized light. We must therefore represent the magnetic force at a point by a stress having a single axis of greatest or least pressure, and all the pressures at right angles to this axis equal. It may be objected that it is inconsistent to represent a line of force, which is essentially dipolar, by an axis of stress, which is necessarily isotropic, but we know that every phenomenon of action and reaction is isotropic in its results, because the effects of the force on the bodies between which it acts are equal and opposite, while the nature and origin of the force may be dipolar, as in the attraction between a north and a south pole. Let us next consider the mechanical effect of a state of stress symmetrical about an axis. We may resolve it, in all eases, into a simple hydrostatic pressure combined with a simple pressure or tension along the axis. When the axis is that of greatest pressure, the force along the axis will be a pressure. When the axis is that of least pressure, the force along the axis will be a tension. If we observe the lines of force between two magnets, as indicated by iron filings, we shall see that whenever the lines of force pass from one pole to another, there is attraction between those poles and where the lines of force from the poles avoid each other and are dispersed into space, the poles repel each other, so that in both cases, they are drawn in the direction of the resultant of the lines of force. It appears therefore that the stress in the axis of a line of magnetic force is a tension, like that of a rope. If we calculate the lines of force in the neighborhood of two gravitating bodies, we shall find them the same in direction as those near two magnetic poles of the same name, but we know that the mechanical effect is that of attraction instead of repulsion. The lines of force in this case do not run between the bodies, but avoid each other, and are dispersed over space. In order to produce the effect of attraction, the stress along the lines of gravitating force must be a pressure. Let us now suppose that the phenomena of magnetism depend on the existence of a tension in the direction of the lines of force, combined with a hydrostatic pressure, or in other words, a pressure greater in the equatorial than in the axial direction, the next question is, what mechanical explanation can we give of this inequality of pressures in a fluid or mobile medium? The explanation which most readily occurs to the mind is that the excess of pressure in the equatorial direction arises from the centrifugal force of vortices or eddies in the medium having their axes in directions parallel to the lines of force. 
This explanation of the cause of the inequality of pressures at once suggests the means of representing the dipolar character of the line of force. Every vortex is essentially dipolar, the two extremities of its axis being distinguished by the direction of its revolution as observed from those points. We also know that when electricity circulates in a conductor, it produces lines of magnetic force passing through the circuit, the direction of the lines depending on the direction of the circulation. Let us suppose that the direction of revolution of our vortices is that in which vitreous electricity must revolve in order to produce lines of force whose direction within the circuit is the same as that of the given lines of force. We shall suppose at present that all the vortices in any one part of the field are revolving in the same direction about axes nearly parallel, but that in passing from one part of the field to another, the direction of the axes, the velocity of rotation, and the density of the substance of the vortices are subject to change. We shall investigate the resultant mechanical effect upon an element of the medium, and from the mathematical expression of this resultant we shall deduce the physical character of its different component parts. Proposition 1. If in two fluid systems geometrically similar the velocities and densities at corresponding points are proportional, then the differences of pressure at corresponding points due to the motion will vary in the duplicate ratio of the velocities and the sample ratio of the densities. Let L be the ratio of the linear dimensions, M that of the velocities, N that of the densities, and P that of the pressures due to the motion. Then the ratio of the masses of corresponding portions will be L cubed N, and the ratio of the velocities acquired in traversing similar parts of the systems will be M, so that L cubed MN is the ratio of the momenta acquired by similar portions in traversing similar parts of the path. The ratio of the surfaces is L squared, that of the forces acting on them is L squared P, and that of the times during which they act is L over M, so that the ratio of the impulse of the forces is L cubed P over M, and we have now L cubed MN equal L cubed P over M, or M squared N equal P. That is, the ratio of the pressures due to the motion P is compounded of the ratio of the densities N, and the difficult ratio of the velocities M squared, and does not depend on the linear dimensions of the moving systems. In a circular vortex, revolving with uniform angular velocity, if the pressure at the axis is P0, that at the circumference will be P1 equal P0 plus 1 half rho v squared, where rho is the density and v is the velocity at the circumference, the mean pressure parallel to the axis will be P0 plus 1 fourth rho v squared equal P2. If a number of such vortices were placed together side by side with the axis parallel, they would form a medium in which there will be a pressure P2 parallel to the axis and a pressure P1 in any perpendicular direction. If the vortices are circular and have uniform angular velocity and density throughout, then P1 minus P2 equal 1 fourth rho v squared. If the vortices are not circular, and if the angular velocity and the density are not uniform, but vary according to the same law for all the vortices, P1 minus P2 equal C rho v squared, where rho is the mean density and C is a numerical quantity depending on the distribution of angular velocity and density in the vortex. In future, we shall write mu over 4 pi instead of C rho so that P1 minus P2 equal 1 over 4 pi mu v squared, where mu is a quantity bearing a constant ratio to the density and v is a linear velocity at the circumference of each vortex. A medium of this kind, filled with molecular vortices having the axis parallel, differs from an ordinary fluid in having different pressures in different directions. If not prevented by properly arranged pressures, it will tend to expand laterally. In so doing, it would allow the diameter of each vortex to expand and its velocity to diminish in the same proportion. In order that a medium having these inequalities of pressure in different directions should be in equilibrium, certain conditions must be fulfilled which we must investigate. Proposition 2. If the direction cosines of the axis of the vortices with respect to the axis of x, y, and z be L, M, and N, to find the normal and tangential stresses on the coordinate planes. The actual stress may be resolved into a simple hydrostatic pressure P1 acting in all directions and a simple tension P1 minus P2 or 1 over 4 pi mu V squared acting along the axis of stress. Hence, if PXX, PYY, and PZZ be the normal stresses parallel to the three axes, consider it positive when they tend to increase those axes, and if PYZ, PZX, and PXY be the tangential stresses in the three coordinate planes, consider it positive when they tend to increase simultaneously the symbols subscribed, then by the resolution of the stresses, PXX equal 1 over 4 pi mu v squared L squared minus P1, PYY equal 1 over 4 pi mu v squared M squared minus P1, PZZ equal 1 over 4 pi mu v squared N squared 
squared minus P1, PYZ equal 1 over 4 pi mu V squared MN, PZX equal 1 over 4 pi mu V squared NL, PXY equal 1 over 4 pi mu V squared LM. If we write alpha equal VL, beta equal VM, and gamma equal VN, then PXX equal 1 over 4 pi mu alpha squared minus P1, PYY equal 1 over 4 pi mu beta squared minus P1, PZZ equal 1 over 4 pi mu gamma squared minus P1, PYZ equal 1 over 4 pi mu beta gamma, PZX equal 1 over 4 pi mu gamma alpha, PXY equal 1 over 4 pi mu alpha beta. Proposition 3. To find the resultant force on an element of the medium arising from the variation of internal stress. We have, in general, for the force in the direction of x per unit of volume by the law of equilibrium of stresses, grid x equal dpxx over dx plus dpxy over dy plus dpxc over dz. In this case, the expression may be written grid x equal 1 over 4 pi d mu alpha over dx multiplied by alpha plus mu alpha d alpha over dx minus 4 pi dp1 over dx plus d mu beta over dy multiplied by alpha plus mu beta d alpha over dy plus d mu gamma over dz multiplied by alpha plus mu gamma d alpha over dz. Remembering that alpha d alpha over dx plus beta d beta over dx plus gamma d gamma over dx equal one half d alpha square plus beta square plus gamma square over dx, this becomes grid x equal alpha one over four pi d mu alpha over dx plus d mu beta over dy plus d mu gamma over dz plus one over eight pi mu d alpha square plus beta square plus gamma square over dx minus mu beta one over four pi d beta over dx minus d alpha over dy plus mu gamma one over 4 pi d alpha over dz minus d gamma over dx minus dp1 over dx. The expressions for the forces parallel to the axis of y and z may be written down from analogy. We have now to interpret the meaning of each term of this expression. We suppose alpha beta gamma to be the components of the force which would act upon that end of a unit magnetic bar which points to the north. Mu represents the magnetic inductive capacity of the medium at any point referred to air as standard. Mu alpha, mu beta, mu gamma represent the quantity of magnetic induction through unit of area perpendicular to the three axes of x, y, z respectively. The total amount of magnetic induction through a closed surface surrounding the pole of a magnet depends entirely on the strength of that pole so that if dx, dy, dz be an element, then d mu alpha over dx plus d mu beta over dy plus d mu gamma over dz multiplied by dx, dy, dz equal 4 pi m dx, dy, dz, which represent the total amount of magnetic induction outward through the surface of the element dx, dy, dz represents the amount of imaginary magnetic matter within the element of the kind which points north. The first term of the value of grid x, therefore, alpha 1 over 4 pi d mu alpha over dx plus d mu beta over dy plus d mu gamma over dz may be written alpha m, where alpha is the intensity of the magnetic force and m is the amount of magnetic matter pointing north in a unit of volume. The physical interpretation of this term is that the force urging a north pole in the positive direction of x is a product of the intensity of the magnetic force resolved in that direction and the strength of the north pole of the magnet. Let the pile lines from left to right in figure 1 represent a field of magnetic force such as that of the Earth, Sn being the direction from south to north. The vortices, according to our hypothesis, will be the direction shown by the arrows in figure 3, that is, in a plane perpendicular to the lines of force and revolving in the direction of the hands of a watch when observed from S looking towards N. The parts of the vortices above the plane of the paper will be moving towards E, and the parts below that plane towards W. We shall always mark by a narrow head the direction in which we must look in order to see the vortices rotating in the direction of the hands of a watch. The arrow head will then indicate the northward direction in the magnetic field, that is, the direction in which that end of a magnet which points to the north will set itself in the field. Now, let A be the end of a magnet which points north. Since it repels the north ends of other magnets, the lines of force will be directed from A outwards in all directions. On the north side, the line AD will be in the same direction with the lines of the magnetic field and the velocity of the vortices will be increased. On the south side, the line AC will be in the opposite direction and the velocity of the vortices will be diminished so that the lines of force are more powerful in the north side of A than on the south side. We have seen that the mechanical effect of the vortices is to produce a tension along the axis so that the resultant effect on A will be to pull it more powerfully towards D than towards C. That is, A will tend to move to the north. Let B in figure 2 represent the south pole. The lines of force belonging to B will tend towards B and we shall find that the lines of force are rendering stronger towards E than towards F, so that the effect in this case is to urge B towards the south. 
It appears, therefore, that on the hypothesis of molecular vortices, our first term gives a mechanical explanation of the force acting on a north or south pole in the magnetic field. We now proceed to examine the second term, 1 over 8 pi mu d alpha squared plus beta squared plus gamma squared over dx. Here, alpha squared plus beta squared plus gamma squared is the square of the intensity of any part of the field, and mu is the magnetic inductive capacity at the same place. Any body therefore placed in the field will be urged towards places of stronger magnetic intensity, with a force depending partly on its own capacity for magnetic induction, and partly on the rate at which the square of the intensity increases. If the body be placed in a fluid medium, then the medium, as well as the body, will be urged towards places of greater intensity so that its hydrostatic pressure will be increased in that direction. The resultant effect on a body placed in the medium will be the difference of the actions on the body and on the portion of the medium which it displaces, so that the body will tend to or form places of greatest magnetic intensity according as it has great, greater or less capacity for magnetic induction than the surrounding medium. In figure 4, the lines of force are represented as converging and becoming more powerful towards the right, so that the magnetic tension at B is stronger than at A, and the body AB will be urged to the right. If the capacity for magnetic induction is greater in the body than in the surrounding medium, it will move to the right, but if less, it will move to the left. We may suppose in this case that the lines of force are converging to a magnetic pole, either north or south, on the right hand. In figure 5, the lines of force are represented as vertical and becoming more numerous towards the right. It may be shown that if the force increases towards the right, the lines of force will be curved towards the right. The effect of the magnetic tensions will then be to draw any body towards the right with a force depending on the excess of its inductive capacity over that of the surrounding medium. We may suppose that in this figure, the lines of force are those surrounding an electric current perpendicular to the plane of the paper and on the right hand of the figure. These two illustrations will show the mechanical effect on a pyrometric or diametric body placed in a field of varying magnetic force whether the increase of force takes place along the lines or transverse for them. The form of the second term of our equation indicates the general law, which is quite independent of the direction of the lines of force and depends solely on the manner in which the force varies from one part of the field to another. We come now to the third term of the value of grid x minus mu beta 1 over phi pi, t beta over tx, minus t alpha over dy. Here, mu beta is as before the quantity of magnetic induction through unit of area perpendicular to the axis of y, and t beta over dx minus d alpha over dy is a quantity which would disappear if alpha dx plus beta dy plus gamma dz were a complete differential. That is, if the force acting on a unit north pole were subject to the condition that no work can be done upon the pole in passing around any closed curve. The quantity represents the work done on a north pole in traveling round unit of area in the direction from plus x to plus y parallel to the plane of xy. Now, if an electric current whose strength is r is traversing the axis of z, which we may suppose points vertically upwards, then if the axis of x is east and that of y north, a unit north pole will be urged round the axis of z in the direction from x to y, so that in one revolution the work done will be 4 pi r. r. Hence, 1 over 4 pi d beta over dx minus d alpha over dy represents the strength of an electric current parallel to z through unit of area, and if we write 1 over 4 pi d gamma over dy minus d beta over dz equal p, 1 over 4 pi d alpha over dz minus d gamma over dx equal q, 1 over 4 pi d beta over dx minus d alpha over dy equal r, then PQR will be the quantity of electric current per unit of area perpendicular to the axis of X, Y, and Z, respectively. The physical interpretation of the third term of grid X minus mu beta R is that if mu beta is the quantity of magnetic induction parallel to Y and R the quantity of electricity flowing in the direction of C, the element will be urged in the direction of minus X, traversely to the direction of the current and of the lines of force. That is, an ascending current in a field of force magnetized towards the north will tend to move west. To illustrate the action of the molecular vortices, let Sn be the direction of magnetic force in the field and let C be the section of an ascending magnetic current perpendicular to the paper.
The lines of force due to this current will be circles drawn in the opposite direction from that of the hands of a watch, that is, in the direction NWSE. At E, the lines of force will be the sum of those of the field and of the current, and at W, there will be the difference of the two sets of lines, so that the vortices on the east side of the current will be more powerful than those on the west side. Both sets of vortices have their equatorial parts turned towards C, so that they tend to expand towards C. But those in the east side have the greatest effect, so that the resultant effect on the current is to urge it towards the west. The fourth term, plus mu gamma 1 over 4 pi d alpha over dz minus d gamma over dx, or plus mu gamma q, may be interpreted in the same way and indicates that a current q in the direction of y, that is, to the north, placed in a magnetic field in which the lines are vertically upwards in the direction of z, will be urged towards the east. The fifth term, minus dp1 over dx, merely implies that the element will be urged in the direction in which the hydrostatic pressure P1 diminishes. We may now write down the expressions for the components of the resultant force on an element of the medium per unit of volume, thus grid x equal alpha m plus 1 over 8 pi mu dv squared over dx minus mu beta r plus mu gamma q minus dp1 over dx grid y equal beta m plus 1 over 8 pi mu dv squared over dy minus mu gamma p plus mu alpha r minus dp1 over dy grid z equal gamma m plus 1 over 8 pi mu dv squared over dz minus mu alpha q plus mu beta p minus dp1 over dz. The first term of each expression refers to the force acting on magnetic poles, the second term to the action on bodies capable of magnetism by induction, the third and fourth terms to the force acting on electric currents, and the fifth to the effect of simple pressure. Before going further into general investigation, we shall consider equations 12, 13, 14, in particular cases corresponding to those simple cases of the actual phenomena which we seek to obtain in order to determine their laws by experiment. We have found that the quantities P, Q, and R represent the resolved parts of an electric current in the three coordinate directions. Let us suppose in the first instance that there is no electric current or that P, Q, and R vanish. We have then by equation 9, d gamma over dy minus d beta over dz equals 0, d alpha over dz minus d gamma over dx equals 0, d beta over dx minus d alpha over dy equals 0. Whence we learn that alpha dx plus beta dy plus gamma dz equals d phi is an exact differential of phi, so that alpha equals d phi over dx, beta equals d phi over dy, gamma equals d phi over dz. Mu is proportional to the density of the vortices and represents the capacity for magnetic induction in the medium. It is equal to 1 in air, or in whatever medium the experiments were made, which determined the powers of the magnets, the strengths of the electric currents, etc. Let us suppose mu constant, then m equal 1 over 4 pi t mu alpha over dx plus t mu beta over dy plus t mu gamma over dz equal 1 over 4 pi mu second derivative of phi with respect to x plus second derivative of phi with respect to y plus second derivative of phi with respect to z represents the amount of imaginary magnetic matter in unit of volume. That there may be no resultant force on that unit of volume arising from the action represented by the first term of equations 12, 13, 14, we must have m equals 0 or second derivative of phi with respect to x plus second derivative of phi with respect to y plus second derivative of phi with respect to z equals zero. Now it may be shown that equation 19, if true within a given space, implies that the forces acting within that space as such as would result from a distribution of centers of force beyond that space, attracting or repelling inversely as a square of the distance. Hence, the lines of force in a part of space where mu is uniform and where there are no electric currents must be such as what will result from the theory of imaginary matter acting at a distance. The assumptions of that theory are unlike those of ours, but the results are identical. Let us first take the case of a single magnetic pole, that is, one end of a long magnet, so long that its other end is too far off to have a perceptive influence on the part of the field we are considering. The conditions then are that equation 18 must be fulfilled at the magnetic pole and 19 everywhere else. The only solution under these conditions is phi equal minus m over mu, 1 over r. 
where r is the distance from the pole and m is the strength of the pole. The repulsion of any point on a unit pole of the same kind is T phi over dr equal m over mu, 1 over s squared. In the standard medium, mu equal 1, so that the repulsion is simply m over s squared in that medium, as has been shown by Coulomb. In a medium having a greater value of mu, such as oxygen, solutions of salt, of iron, etc., the attraction on our theory ought to be less than in air. And in diametric media, such as water, melted bismuth, etc., the attraction between the same magnetic poles ought to be greater than in air. The experiments necessary to demonstrate the difference of attraction of two magnets according to the magnetic or diametric character of the medium in which they are placed would require good precision on account of the limited range of magnetic capacity in the fluid media known to us and the small amount of the difference sought for as compared for the wall attraction. Let us next take the case of an electric current whose quantity is C flowing through a cylindrical conductor whose radius is R and whose length is infinite as compared with the size of the field of force considered. Let the axis of the cylinder be that of C and the direction of the current positive, then within the conductor, the quantity of current per unit of area is R equal C over P R squared equal 1 over 4 pi d beta over dx minus d alpha over dy. So that within the conductor, alpha equal minus 2C over R squared y, beta equal 2C over R squared x, gamma equal 0. Beyond the conductor, in the space around it, phi equal 2C actangent y over x, alpha equal d phi over dx equal minus 2cy over x squared plus y squared, beta equal d phi over dy equal 2cx over x squared plus y squared, gamma equal d phi over dz equal 0. If rho equal square root of x squared plus y squared is a perpendicular distance of any point from the axis of the conductor, a unit north pole will experience a force equal 2c over rho, tending to move it round the conductor in the direction of the hands of a watch if the observer view it in the direction of the current. Let us now consider a current running parallel to the axis of z in the plane of xc at a distance rho. Let the quantity of the current be C prime, and let the length of the part considered be L, and its section S, so that C prime over S is its strength per unit of section. Putting this quantity for rho in equations, 12, 13, 14, we find. Grade x equal minus mu beta C prime over S per unit of volume, and multiplying by Ls, the volume of the conductor considered, we find. Grade x equal minus mu beta C prime L, equal minus 2 mu c c prime l over rho, showing that the second conductor will be attracted towards the first with a force inversely as the distance. We find in this case also that the amount of attraction depends on the value of mu, but that it varies directly instead of inversely as mu, so that the attraction between two conducting wires will be greater in oxygen than in air, and greater in air than in water. We shall next consider the nature of electric currents and electromotive forces in connection with the theory of molecular vortices.